DID Hatchery and I've been gone for a while. Um, I just wanted to come back to say hello and do an update basically and just tell you several things that have been going on since the time I haven't been here. Well, as many know, I'm not sure if everybody does, but um, my mom died three weeks ago. Editing Hatchery here, my mother died on September 28th, not October 28th. The altar you are watching is the split altar that came from the 28th. She's very much like Brandy, but she's not Brandy. This version of Brandy is extremely dissociated from our mother's death. She doesn't feel much about it. That's the purpose, that is her role. And that is why she mistook the date of our mother's death. This is an example of extreme dissociation. As I said in the video, we are very dissociated in this. And she keeps us from losing our minds while the process of grief is going on. When Brandy comes out, actual Brandy, Brandy breaks down. She can't handle what happened. There are a lot of details we haven't mentioned about the whole situation with our mother dying. And that is why this altar is here doing the video. And that is why they mistook my mother's death date because they are not attached to it. This is dissociation in action. This is what it looks like and what it means to have DID. And this is why people mistake their own information sometimes. Sometimes I don't know my own birthday things like that. So I just wanted to point out that this is an example of severe dissociation. Thanks. Um, it feels like a million years ago at this point for some reason, but it was only three weeks ago. Yeah, October 28th. Um, the day that Hurricane Ian hit Florida. And so that that has been a strange process, especially dealing with grief while you're suffering from DID. Because what I'm learning is, because I've never had a major loss like this while I was aware that I had DID. All my major losses often happened prior to my knowledge, you know, and so it's not like I was looking for anything back then. But what I found is that not all parts of me know that my mother has died. Um, some parts know, some parts don't know at all. Some parts have no emotional memory of it. They might know logically, but have no emotions toward it. Um, I think it's part of the stages of grieving, denial, and so I think different parts of me are in different stages. Some parts already know, and some parts have moved on to anger <laughs> and what are all the other stages. So different stages, I'm not sure. But right this moment, you know, I don't have a lot of emotional connection to it because I'm dissociated from it. But I can tell you a story, like, about... Well, first I'll tell you that I didn't get to see my mother before she passed. Because I'm from a traumatized family. You know, it's not just one... You know, you don't come... You don't have DID and come from a family that isn't traumatized. It's not just me. It's a whole family unit that is just traumatized and riddled with trauma. So we're not very good at communicating with each other. We don't call each other because calling is often triggering. Not because you don't like your family member or you don't wanna to talk to them, but because just trauma keeps you from doing it and that's one of the things that I didn't do very well in my mother's last years is to call her as much as I should have because every time I talked to her, it was always the same conversation because my mother was mentally ill and hearing the same 
like a rigmarole, like the, what she had to say over and over the same thing was always very triggering and upsetting to me. So I never called as much as I should have, not because I didn't love her more than anybody on earth, but because of trauma. And I want people to understand that this is what trauma does. This is what it takes away from you, okay? This is what they mean by how has it affected or damaged your life. My trauma damaged my life because it made it so I didn't speak to my mother the way I should have the years leading up to her death. Um, that I didn't visit the way I should have because visiting was traumatic for me. Um, and also it explains the behavior of other people in my family. And I'm not gonna name names of course, but I had no idea my mother was dying until literally my family thought she was gonna die within the next five minutes. That's when I got a phone call. That's when I got the phone call. And I was very angry about that, but at the same time, trauma explains it. So I have to be empathetic regarding that. Um, so basically I got a call that, you know, she's gonna die in five minutes. And they put my the phone on speaker and I just yelled out, mom. And I was like, can she hear me? And they're like, yeah, she can hear you. And I, she couldn't speak, but I heard her go like, uh, like that. And I said, you know, I love you more than anything on earth. And and I would not have wanted another mother ever. And I was so proud of her. And I will love her for the rest of time, basically, is what I said over the phone. And then that's all. And then, you know, we thought she was gonna die. But then that call, her hearing my voice and the fact that my brother and sister were there at the hospital, it caused my mother to rally. And so she started getting better. She was in like the intensive, intensive care unit, you know, being looked after. Oh, and the reason she was in the hospital was because of COVID, she died of COVID, which was entirely unnecessary. And in totally another part of this conversation, um, a family member refused to get my mother vaccinated and my mother had cancer, two types of cancer. So her immune system wasn't good. And we told this family member many times to get my mother vaccinated and she refused because of politics. And the doctor even said if my mother had been vaccinated, she wouldn't have been in the hospital. And so, you know, I will always tell you to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. But anyway, and I'm sorry if this is a uh, disjointed, but I'm probably gonna be switching throughout, even if it's subtle and you maybe not notice, um, and telling different parts of the stories at, at different times, because this is extremely difficult, you know? <laughs> And so uh, I think I was saying that, um, yeah, I didn't get a call until like they thought she was absolutely gonna die. And then she rallied for a few days. And so she was getting better and get, getting better and getting better. And she ended up going down to the step down unit from the ICU, which is not like the regular unit, but it's like a step down from ICU where you still have a lot of supervision. Um, and so Hurricane Ian, <laughs> and because nothing in my life can be simple. I just tell you this now. Nothing in my life has ever, ever come without extreme complication. So, because nothing can be simple, I couldn't just fly out to my mother immediately. Hurricane Ian was coming. My mother actually died while Hurricane Ian was hitting. And at the time it was heading right for where she was located and flights, getting flights in would have been difficult and so I was listening to my family. I was, I was monitoring. I was like, should I come? Should I come? Should I come? And they're like, okay, no, no, she's okay. She'll make it till Monday, which I planned to come out the Monday after the hurricane was over um, because they were telling me she was getting better. And so Hurricane Ian, if that hadn't happened, I would have seen my mother, but it was just really complex, the whole thing. And so, she didn't, she didn't make it to Monday. She died um, suddenly. 
when we thought she was getting better. And that is like the story of what happened there. But here's another story of what happened the day my mother died. The day my mother died, I was on a Skype call with friends. And suddenly, and I mean, I was just having a normal Skype call. And then suddenly in the middle of the Skype call, I got extremely ill. I got panicky and ill. And I had to lay down in the middle of this call. And I just was gone. I had this massive, I had the worst headache I'd ever had in my whole life, which now I think might have been splitting. I might have been splitting. Um, so I had this really bad headache that I'd never had a headache like this. And so I was laying down and I was having panic attack at the same time and I just thought something bad was happening, something bad. I'm, I'm, I felt ill. Um, and I texted um, my psychologist friend. I texted him something I have never texted him. And trust me, I've texted this man a million things. He's known me since I was 20. So this I'd never texted before. And I didn't remember texting it. I mean, I kind of remember it's very blurry, but I didn't remember the words I was texting. You know what I mean? Like, but apparently I texted him and I can show it to you. I can, I guess I could put the screenshot up there. Something like, I'm sick, I'm gonna die, I'm sick. Now, I texted that at 4.38 p.m. My time, which would have been 7.30, around 7.30, Florida time. My mother died at 9.30 p.m. that night. So I honestly, like, I'm telling you right now, I was ne I've never been a spiritual person, but I believe that was my mother telling me. I absolutely 100% believe she was telling me that she's sick, she's gonna die, she's sick, and I texted it to him. It's like I channeled her. And I think two hours before she actually pronounced her dead, she realized she was absolutely gonna die. I think that's what happened. She was seized by a fear and knowledge that she was going to die, and two hours later she did. And I got that vibe across the country, and I got sick, and I said, I'm sick, I'm gonna die, I'm sick, because I wasn't sick, I wasn't sick, and I certainly wasn't going to die. Um, and so I didn't know for sure, but I knew, I knew that day that my mother was gone. I looked at my phone after I, I went to sleep with that massive headache because I couldn't, I just fell asleep. And then, um, I looked at my phone and I saw a million texts from my brother and I was like, okay, she's gone. She's gone or calls, not texts, like 10 phone calls, which is like, okay, she's gone. Um, but I didn't wanna believe it, so I didn't call him back right away, cause I couldn't, it was the middle of the night. He wasn't at the hospital and he wasn't answering. I don't know, maybe I did call him. Maybe I called him, I can't remember right now. But then the next day I woke up, I called my brother to confirm, which I, what I already knew. And he's like, yeah, she passed at 9.30 and so, I expected to feel at the time just inconsolable grief upon this knowledge. But something was with me. My mother was with me in my room, not physically. I felt her and I felt, I, she told me, she had like not in words, but basically I felt extremely strong feelings that were not mine, that were just like, I'm free, I'm okay, I'm happy, I'm where I wanna be, I'm free, I'm free. Like that's the feeling that pervaded my body so powerfully that I almost couldn't be sad. And I knew that was my mother, I know it. And so now I know there's something after and it's benevolent. And I will never doubt that again because my mother told me. And that feeling stayed with me that whole day. And it was so powerful. And it was so certain that I knew it was her and I knew my mother would tell me. I just knew she would tell me and she did. And so I know wherever she is, she's free because you know, some of us in this life don't, don't get to live happy lives. My mother was one of those people. 
My mother had an extremely hard life. Since she was 25 years old, her life has been extremely difficult. Extreme struggle, extreme suffering. It's not a life anybody would want to live. And since I'd spent, since I was three years old, I'd spent my life losing my mother. You don't, you know, like three is when she got sick. Prior to that, I was her baby girl. I had a very special bond with my mother, more than my sister and brother. I, I was her youngest, I almost drowned. I, that made a special attachment, you know, like I was my mama's baby. I was a mama's girl. And so, I don't know why I was saying that, but um, no. Oh. Anyway, I can't remember what I was gonna say. Uh, I but my mom did. She had a very difficult, difficult life, and to know that she is free and happy, and in possession of all her power now, makes me happy. Because I believe that. I believe that now. And she doesn't have to deal with the suffering of the world and the strictures of the world and everything the world puts on a human being. So. Oh, I said something like, oh, I was always losing my mother since I was three. Yeah. So since, you know, I was three years old, I've been losing my mother to mental illness, you know, more and more and more, you know. And sometimes, you know, my mom would get a little bit better and I'd get more of my mother back, but then it would go again when another episode would hit, you know. And so, I don't know, it's a weird grieving process. Sometimes I break down, sometimes I don't even know my mother has died. And sometimes I feel nothing at all. And so, so we had her funeral in Tennessee and I flew out there with no expectations. I was afraid to go and look at the casket. She had a lavender casket because purple and pink were her favorite colors and it was purple. And so I loved that. Um, and what I noticed is I, I didn't want to go and look at my mother in her casket. I, I didn't. I didn't want to see, because I hadn't seen my mom in years physically. And so I was afraid, you know, then my sister, she said to me, don't worry, Brandy. She looks like Mamma. She looks just like Mamma. And Mamma was the other love of my life. That was my grandmother, my mother's mother. And so I took a deep breath and I walked in and my mother looked like Mamma. She looked just like my grandmother and that calmed me. But then I noticed in the coffin, oh, my light went out. So I noticed in the um, coffin that people were putting things in with my, see, nobody tells me anything. You don't understand. I, didn't, I don't get told anything. I don't get told like bring something or anything. So people were putting objects to go with my mother in the coffin. And I'm like, well, I don't have anything. So I immediately walked over to the funeral director and I asked him for a pair of scissors and I cut my hair off. I cut a lock of hair off and I, I don't know what's going on with this. And I put it in my mother's hand, which I was happy to have in there. But at the same time, I made the mistake of touching her hand, um, which is a sensation I'm never gonna forget and I wish I never had a memory of. <laughs> Uh, it just doesn't feel right. I would never suggest anything. You do what you want at a funeral, but maybe don't touch anything. Oh, this light's not gonna work. I have to fix. I have to change the the lighting. Then I don't know what to do. Okay, so I'm just gonna do this, whatever. And, um, yes, yeah, so I put my lock of hair <clears throat> on my mother's coffin. I touched her hand, which I regret, because I will never forget that sensation and what that felt like. Um, it did not feel normal, did not feel human. Um, and my sister gave me the best gift anybody could have given me. 
She gave me the one thing I, I wanted if, if my mother ever died. The one thing I wanted, she gave it to me without me even asking. She gave me my mother's mother's ring, which I, I meant to put on for this video, but I forgot, like things just go. Um, it's basically a ring where you have all your children's birthstones. And so my mom's was Garnet Peridot Garnet because my brother and sister have the same birth month. And I'm Peridot. <clears throat> and so I try to wear that every day around my neck because her fingers were small. Um, okay, so yeah, and so yeah, I flew out, we went to the funeral and that's, that's that. And I've just been dealing with the aftermath ever since trying to figure, like, some, like I said, some altars know, some altars don't. Some altars have extreme feelings about it, some have none. Um, and it just depends on the time of day and the trigger and the thoughts, you know? <laughs> and that's what it's like to grieve with DID. You just don't know what's gonna happen. At this, but you know, I was gonna give you an update on other things too. So another thing I found out around this time, um, since I recently got a primary care physician, is that my thyroid was all like messed up. And if you know anything about thyroids, thyroids can affect your feelings, your physical appearance, all your weight and everything. And my weight's been fluctuating, you know, dramatically. As it turns out, I was I, I had hypothyroidism for years. Since I was in my 30s, I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism, so like a slow thyroid. So I was put on a certain medication to like raise it. But I was never told by my doctor, my old doctor in Florida, that you're supposed to get regular blood tests with this medication because it can it's, it can be strange, you know? So I just kept taking it for years. I took this medicine, I took this medicine, and I had all these symptoms, but I attribute these, I attributed them to like aging. I'm 45, so I attributed it to like, I don't know, pre-menopause or something. Like, I don't know, nobody talks about menopause enough, okay? So I don't, I didn't know. I just assumed that everything I was feeling was due to like aging. You know, like my skin was very dry and my hair was brittle and like I was having terrible insomnia for years and sweating and, all kinds of stuff. And all those symptoms turned out to be thyroid issues, <laughs> which I'm just learning. And so there, you have two hormones in your thyroid. So one of my hormones was through the roof, through the roof. And the other one was through the floor, almost none at all in my body. So I had these mixed, this mixed symptomology because one was high and one was low. And so now I'm in the process of detoxing from the medication and trying to see what my body naturally levels my thyroid out too and then they're gonna you know the doctor's gonna proceed whatever needs to happen and so you know that's interesting because for a few couple years i've had a severe form of like depression no maybe it's anhedonia it basically i had an inability to feel a certain level of ha like i had a ceiling to my happiness i couldn't really get happy i couldn't get excited it would stop and it it just wouldn't go past a certain point, which made life extremely difficult for me. I wasn't able to find meaning. I wasn't able to feel good about anything. And so it just, you know, made it hard to make videos, makes it hard to do anything. But now that the medicine is has been taken out of my system for weeks now, I'm starting to kind of feel alive again. Like, like I can feel excited occasionally about things. And maybe that's why I was able to make this video today, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure. So like I had the thyroid thing, which really affects your psyche and affects and causes severe depression and stuff like that. On top of the grief, it was a mess. It was a mess. And so it was, like I said, hard to make videos, <laughs> hard to do anything really. And so that's another thing that happened. And then the third thing that's been going on is I finally found a therapist that I can see that takes my insurance. So I've, I've had my first appointment with a therapist and they know my diagnosis and we're going to work on basically some form of parts therapy. I don't know specifically what yet, but um, you know, they, they're gonna treat me. Uh, they treat difficult cases where I am, where I'm going. Um, and so I'm excited about that. <laughs> That's very important. I've 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 known I need ther I've needed therapy for years. You just you need therapy when you have DID. Period. You need when you have if you have DID, you need therapy. Okay, that's it. That's how that goes. It's not if, it's definitely. And so I've been looking for a therapist forever. 
and finally I got accepted. I got accepted right after I got refused from one particular place that I really wanted to get into. I finally got a referral after six months of trying to get certain insurance in order to get a referral. I get the insurance, then I get a primary care physician, I get the referral, and then they just refused me. They were just like, no, we don't have any enough people in that specialization. They didn't have enough dissociative disorder doctors, and so nope. And so I thought it was hopeless. And then so I was calling around like I always was. And I just stumbled upon this doctor's office and I called them like three times, but my phone didn't go through. It just died every time I tried. So I thought, okay, there's something wrong with this phone number. And I just moved on. And I probably never would have called this number again. But then they like called me back three times. And I was like, oh, okay. And then they set me up an appointment and they took my insurance. It was like kind of a miracle. And so now I'm finally in treatment. Finally, finally, finally. So maybe I'll get somewhere. You know, the first uh, session I was being evaluated and he knew about my DID. He said, so what do you want? He's like, do you want to integrate? I'm like, yesterday. Yes, please. I want to integrate yesterday. This is not a fun game for me. Um, I don't enjoy it. It ruins my life. It makes everything impossible. So yes, please, let's do this, you know? And so honestly, if people have problem with integ integration, I'm working towards it and that's what I want. And uh, if I can fuse, I hope to fuse one day because I want, I want all of my intentions aligned. I want to be able to do what I want to do when I want to do them and not be crippled by, you know, PTSD symptoms or other alters refusing to do things. Because one of my great struggles is other alters refusals to do things. So they have a sense of uh, lack of fairness. They're just like, that's not fair. This alter gets to do the thing they wanted to do, but I didn't get to do the thing I wanted to do. So I'm not gonna let that alter do the thing they wanna do. That's basically like the whole dynamic of my system <laughs> is uh, infighting um, amongst alters I don't even know because I have so much amnesia and some that I do know and people in parts, not people, parts refusing to let other parts do things, which makes us unable to almost do anything. Although it's getting a little better now that the thyroid thing has cleared up and the depression is lifting. The thyroid depression, not like, I also have clinical depression naturally, but the, the thyroid depression was a different type of depression that I'd never felt before. It was that inability to get excited that uh, it was just soul destroying soul destroying it just makes you feel like there's no point in staying alive and i'm glad that's lifting it was like two years of awful feelings you know and it just didn't feel like my normal depression because even in my normal depressions even in my darkest times the darkness had a passion to it it was like a passionate darkness like i'm this was like a deadness like no passion passionless empty a limited range of emotions. And that went on for a year, like a couple years. It was really hard, it was really hard. But, um, so this is just a rambling update. I wanted to say hi and I finally could make a video and I gotta, I gotta make them when I can, <laughs> take what I can get. And um, I'm sorry if it's a little disjointed. I've been switching throughout and you might be able to tell by my tone at different times, maybe not. But um, I hope everybody's doing well and you know, let me know how you doing. You know, I'm, we missed you and uh, we love you guys and we, we hope you enjoy this video. Okay, you have a good one.